money is the base problem of international connected society and the monetary layer is the most important one because it's the link it's the bridge if bitcoin really becomes the obvious monetary layer it'll be a very difficult next 20 to 50 years but of course there's hope then with superior monetary technology it provides people with leisure and leisure is the basis of culture that explains all the cultural flourishing we've seen in the arts and music. It's all based on the sound money structure and the bourgeoisie, uh, you can call it, or citizens that had independent means. Future scenario, of course, is a new renaissance, so a new cultural flourishing uh, that not only brings us to new cultural heights, but also new technologies that make life easier for everyone and have rich experiences um, while we are on this planet. Today, we have a conversation with Rahim Takizadian, a distinguished representative of the Austrian School of Economics in Vienna. Rahim has an extensive background as a professor, having lectured at the University of Liechtenstein, the Vienna University of Economics, and several others. As an author of multiple best-selling books, including The Austrian School for Investors and The Zero Interest Trap, he is a sought-after speaker known for his deep insights into economic theory, Prepared to step into a conversation that challenges the way we think about society, Rahim discusses the basics of Austrian economic thought, providing a unique lens through which he explores the intersections of freedom, currency, and the human experience. He combines a respect for history lessons with a sharp critique of contemporary economic practices, compelling us to re-examine what we often take for granted. Rahim guides us through the hidden costs of fiat currency, the overlooked repercussions that extend beyond mere numbers and into the erosion of trust, autonomy, and cultural values. He'll shed light on how Bitcoin, far from just being an innovative financial tool, represents a profound shift towards sound money principles that could reshape not just finance, but the very fabric of civilization itself. We explore questions that resonate deeply with anyone curious about the future, how does the structure of money influence human flourishing and long-term prosperity? If you're in the middle of your Bitcoin journey and you've wondered about what Austrian economics is and how it relates to Bitcoin, this is the episode that promises to keep you on the edge of your seat, enlightening you to the benefits of sound money principles and a strong economic tradition that was nearly lost to history. But before we do that, I want to introduce our sponsors, Stampseed, The Orange Pill App, and Swan. Our partners are businesses and people that we respect and our products that we at Bit Intelligence personally use. You're watching 21 Voices. The Austro School emerged uh, in a society that was in crisis and monetary issues as well. It was a time of the gold standards, but only one layer was gold and it was centralized in the central banks and uh, uh, politicians and bankers had figured out that you can take advantage of the monetization of government debt uh, to increase the financial uh, basis that was then later on really necessary for financing the world wars. So it was uh, all talk about crisis. Karl Menger was part of the expert uh, councils figuring out uh, how to save the currency and so on. That was also then Ludwig von Mises' main expertise. He, was considered the world leading uh, monetary economist uh, of the time. So it's all understanding a crisis of currencies and then figuring out how they are linked to economic crisis, financial crisis. There's a kind of business cycle theory that was developed by the Austrian school. So that of course led an interest to gold that was the standard at the time. But from the much deeper bottom-up appreciation of monetary phenomena, Menger and Mises uh, and so on, knew that uh, about the importance of a monetary network and a global monetary network. Um, gold played an important part in that. It was the kind of merchant standard uh, of money. It was not particular gold coins. One of the most important ones was the florin, which is really just an abstract standard of a certain weight and fineness of gold. Uh, which is not dependent on the actual coinage and then the actual coins running around uh, because uh, since time immemorial, governments have almost always uh, abused the uh, monopoly of minting and guaranteeing the coins. There was an appreciation within the Austrian school from uh, private citizens using 
gold as a savings technology as it's the only economic tradition that has respect for the saver. Most other things that it's oh, that's the most boring thing of people just hoarding stuff. And the Austrian school realized, no, there's something very natural about saving. It's we all get older. That shapes our human action. That's an essence. So we have to turn our income into wealth uh, and to then in old age turn wealth into income again. That saving that you're not consuming, but usually it's a challenge because things don't last that long. Uh, so you need something that's long lasting and uh, you can put on the side uh, and maintains the purchasing power in other goods that you may then need. So gold has been and is still appreciated as a savings technology. Gold is now mostly centralized hoards. Uh, and even among gold bucks, it doesn't really play any active role. So it's just limited to the savings uh, technology, plus a little uh, industrial uh, usage uh, of gold um, still remaining. Uh, so for historical reasons uh, and as a savings technology, gold has been one important asset that Austrian economists have looked at. If our civilization lacks the ability to save, that usually leads to an expression of a very high time preference, which means short-termism. It lacks the capacity to build up something sustainable. Because saving really is about coping with uncertainty of the passage of time. That the future is uncertain, it's profoundly uncertain, no one can predict it. Uh, so saving is the device to cope with that uncertainty and we kind of time arbitrage you can exchange as a kind of exchange you exchange with your future self this kind of time exchange as an s or maybe even more important function than the spatial exchange that we usually associate uh, with economics with so the division of labor is very important and uh, the time exchange leads to another kind of division it's uh, you can do things when you know about them and you can prepare for things that are not known uh, yet. Uh, and without that, there would be very little capital creation and, and very little productivity developing over time. And it's only by being able to make use of those monetary networks and the savings technologies has uh, humanity escaped that kind of continuously miserable existence uh, for most people. Uh, nowadays, uh, the ability to save is not equally distributed. Uh, not everyone has the same access. If you are in the know and have access, <laughs> then you can, of course, make up for uh, depreciation and you can still uh, find the kind of technologies to enable you to cope with that uncertainty. For many people, that's not the case. And for many, they are misled uh, by the money illusion of not really seeing and understanding how fiat money works uh, and that is not the proper savings technology. So that leads to distortions. One is increased inequality and increasing inequality, which uh, because it's not properly understood, so leads to a kind of sense of unfairness and then political upheaval uh, eventually. Uh, and the other is a distortion uh, that uh, if you don't have a proper measure for things, not everyone is affected equally, things get distorted. Uh, and these distortions, the main impact is the production structure of the world is not in good fit anymore to the preferences of the people. So more and more people have the impression that what's produced and provided on the market doesn't really reflect the preferences of real people. That of course leads to another kind of upheaval, it's a kind of skepticism towards entrepreneurs who are usually then the bearers of the bad messages for prices, uh, if prices go up. Or if there's distortion, they are the providers of goods that you don't get. Uh, and you think, okay, why are they scaling up that kind of uh, stuff? And why not the things I'd like to see? That's the impact, uh, which are very wide ranging impacts, so even into the minute details of aesthetics, of architecture of food uh, uh, and so on. So really money is the base problem of um, international uh, connected society and the monetary layer is the most important one because it's the link, it's the bridge. And if those links are distorted, uh, uh, then of course the whole thing gets distorted and inflammated. Most of the crazy ideologies he called inflammations of the soul. Uh, so something in the world really leads to an inflammation of your soul. You can grasp it, you just feel disorder and then you may even long for disorder to get out of that.
the reason or one good reasons for going for things that don't last that long is because of course yourself you are in very volatile contexts it can be volatile relationships but it can also be volatile jobs and volatile locations uh, because it's a world in in change uh, and and uh, dynamics of change are increasing quite tr tr drastically for some people uh, so that's a, uh, a kind of natural change of preferences, which of course is linked to all these distortions. You are not sure anymore about yourself and how the world and yourself match, uh, and it's really hard to explain. And then you take sides, you tend to take sides, and then it's either this idea that, oh, I'm profoundly good and everything else is evil, I've got a throw souls uh, uh, approach that you can have in some conspiracy shaped thinking, it's like, oh, as a kind of paranoid. Uh, way we would be so great but all those evil people plotting against us uh, and deciding upon every detail of the products that surround us and everyone was, is out to get us uh, versus the other extreme now is the best possible world we live in and you can be grateful for everything there is uh, of course the truth is uh, somewhere in between it's not in the middle <laughs> it's somewhere in between and you have to discern those different factors and, and that's the methodological systemic approach of the Austrian school has been as well go from the complex phenomena and try to figure out how the action, the individual action that actually can lead to that uh, and what other complex layers in between that uh, help you differentiate the different phenomena. Bitcoin may become a very important monetary layer. It is already uh, an important savings technology for more and more people. Uh, I see it become potentially a monetary layer connecting people that are within different geopolitical areas of the world that may turn out to be enemies and cut the other ties. Uh, so we already see the financial system gets heavily politicized with sanctions and so on. We see the striving of other geopolitical areas uh, to find alternatives. Uh, and uh, what then will be the remaining bridge between all those people um, and, and uh, Bitcoin has a chance of being the last remaining link and the last possibility for peace uh, on that planet and win-win relations on that planet when unfortunately everything else may turn us against each other again. Please bear with us for a quick message from our sponsors. These videos take a lot of time to make and we've partnered with brands we trust like Stampseed and the Orange Pill app in order to get the funding we need to bring you these videos every week. Don't store your Bitcoin in cold storage without stamping your seed phrase on an indestructible titanium plate. Stamp seed is fireproof, rust proof, impact proof, and easy to hide. It has no loose parts and will give you ultimate peace of mind that your Bitcoin is safe and sound for the long term. Click the link in the description below for 15% off your stamping kit. When I finally got Bitcoin, it hit me like a lightning bolt. It was the currency of the future, the only money that truly mattered. But there was a problem. I didn't know anyone else that thought like me. That is until I discovered the Orange Pill app. Suddenly I was connected with a network of like-minded Bitcoin enthusiasts right in my own city. The Orange Pill app is more than just a social network. It's a community of passionate individuals determined to change the world, one Satoshi at a time. This series is brought to you by Swan and created by Bit Intelligence. Remember to like this video and subscribe to both our channels for more videos like this every week. Thanks for watching. If uh, Bitcoin really becomes the obvious monetary layer, it'll be a very difficult next 20 to 50 years because that'll be a sign of really the uh, current structure breaking apart. Uh, so if everyone really consciously has to use Bitcoin, that probably will not be a good world order. But of course, there's like the hope then with potentially superior monetary technology bringing about uh, a next, <laughs> next renaissance, then maybe 100 years, uh, who knows. Uh, 
those, those are the crystal balls. Uh, the more likely and a bit more optimistic scenario is, of course, as a gradual process and it gradually finds its place. And uh, many people probably in 20 years still are not consciously using it, uh, but not seeing how it's part of the whole structure that surrounds them and, and how it was a fix for some problems. And if, if it wasn't there, they'd really see it uh, and really figure out that it's missing. So I, I'd rather see that uh, playing a more and more important role for the global economy and, and in particular the kind of private economy that's not directed and, and planned by big political entities. Um, we, I think we'll see the process in the European Union becoming, going more towards a planned economy. China unfortunately already has been going that way uh, for a while now. Bitcoin there has an outsized importance, uh, even if in 20 years we won't say it's like the euro or like the dollar and, and like the volume and, and dominance uh, and hasn't acquired all assets uh, yet. It'll be probably one of the last possibilities for private wealth to be maintained and actively used in that world. Uh, and I think the impact of private wealth is much, much more important because it's private people that can have different ideas and innovate, they can have a great outsized impact in technology and, and how, how we live and how our lives are shaped. And that's usually how changes happen through small minorities that have the means and the technologies available to them to shape the world to the better. Oh, without Bitcoin, without uncensorable, permissionless money, then I think there's really would be little hope. Uh, we'd still have transport technologies and internet, uh, uh, which uh, help to reduce the power of the centralized structures, but they just react and immobilize people and censor uh, as much as they can. And we already have the protected silos of uh, Chinese internet uh, versus the rest. Uh, and uh, even countries like Germany is one of the places that censors the most in the internet. They just have these issues with history. Uh, so without Bitcoin, there'd be less hope to because then most wealth will really be linked to your immobile structures and that's in Europe, that's the main alternative. The, any family that has private means of themselves that isn't dependent on the salary uh, usually is in real estate. So that's how you make money in, in Europe and how you preserve money more importantly. Uh, and that of course is terribly immobile. <laughs> And so you are dependent on going along with the political structures around you. And so Bitcoin really is, is, is the big uh, escape. That's important without an exit. Even if just a few people using it, you will have more and more pressure on everyone else. Positive scenario of having a sound savings technology is that it provides people with leisure. And leisure is the basis of culture. It's like you are not dependent to live from uh, hands to the mouth, like every day toiling uh, to survive. Uh, uh, you can time your focus. Uh, you can go for things that are not in the short term uh, profitable, but have a long term profit. Uh, so that's underrated, I think. And that uh, we have, we should have learned in Europe uh, how Something like the Scottish Enlightenment arose, which was culturally very important, arose out of the leisure of the tobacco merchants, uh, that while their ships were going, they had some important monetary <laughs> uh, technology, was, was at the time the precious metal-based uh, merchant standards uh, that they would use at the fairs uh, and, and at, at trading notes. Uh, and uh, I think the Austrian school was the outgrowth of an Austrian enlightenment, a very similar concept. And that's people that are practical people, they're entrepreneurs, they're uh, engineers, they're doing something, uh, but at the same time have leisure. This means they don't have to do just what brings, what guarantees the salary and the survival of the family. Uh, so they can pursue their own interests uh, and that led to uh, lots of entrepreneurs just reading books and uh, conversing with people and then going to the brightest minds of the time and just either hire them as mentors for their kids uh, or, or join the discussion clubs at a salon. The salon was like you have your private uh, uh, living room and you invite interesting people 
the more interesting the people, the higher the standing of your salon. Uh, and of course, you get some prestige. Uh, that's an added incentive, but uh, you must have an interest in deep ideas as well. That explains all the cultural flourishing we've seen in the arts and music. And uh, it's all this kind of private philanthropy, or I'd, I'd say philanthropy, usually if it's good philanthropy, is a very long-term investment. So something maybe my kids will be beneficiaries, maybe someone I don't know yet will be a beneficiary. And that's where all great culture comes from. And that's why Austria maybe is still, or Vienna still sounds, uh, uh, or has, has that ring of high culture. It's all based on the very material layer of a sound money structure. And the big bourgeoisie, uh, you can call it, or citizens that had independent means. So they pursued crazy ideas at the time and they invested in crazy artists uh, uh, that no one really considered important uh, at the time. And they made that possible, that cultural flourishing. So the future scenario, of course, is a new renaissance, uh, a new cultural flourishing uh, that not only brings us to new cultural heights, uh, and aesthetic heights and heights of experience, uh, but also new technologies that uh, make life easier for everyone and improve dramatically our uh, standard of living. Probably even make us live longer and better lives and have rich experiences uh, while we are on this planet. Raheem and I spent several hours diving into these topics for far longer than we had planned to. Today, he helped us peel back the layers of economic systems that often operate unnoticed, yet influence our lives profoundly. We've dissected the hidden consequences of fiat currency, how it erodes value, not only in just wealth, but in the very fabric of trust and autonomy. He painted a compelling picture of Bitcoin as a beacon of hope a re-emergence of sound money principles that promises a path back to individual sovereignty and long-term thinking. How does fiat shape our individual actions and preferences? In a world that often prioritizes short-term thinking and immediate gratification, are we capable of cultivating a culture that values patience, resilience, and enduring prosperity? As cultures all across the world independently developed and upheld sound money systems for millennia before fiat. So don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this every week. Thanks for watching.